Hello, this is Deborah Baker with the CISO Guide to Cyber Resilience podcast. All right, so welcome back to the CISO Guide to Cyber Resilience podcast, where we explore the latest in cybersecurity and best practices to keep your organization safe. Hi, I'm Deborah Baker, and today's episode is packed with critical updates. We'll be diving into the recent CrowdStrike outage that left IT administrators worldwide in crisis mode, and we'll also cover a massive data breach that has just come to light. As always, I'm joined by my amazing co-host, Isabella Otero. Oh, Deborah, thank you. Wow, so a lot has happened since CrowdStrike, and there is a lot to unpack today. So the CrowdStrike incident alone had serious implications, but now we're also facing a major, a major data breach that's exposed billions of personal records. If you're in IT or security management, you won't want to miss this episode. So let's start with the CrowdStrike outage. On July 19th, admins around the globe were hit with the dreaded blue screen of death, thanks to a faulty update from CrowdStrike. Microsoft estimates that around 8.5 million Windows devices were impacted, disrupting everything from airlines to retail shops. It wasn't a cyber attack, but it sure felt like one. I can agree to that. Everyone was kind of freaking out, you know, when they saw, you know, the titles of CrowdStrike all over the news. (laughs) But the root of the problem, administrators who thought they were safe by using older software versions, like, which I think is crazy. I feel like you should never use any old software versions, especially if new patches come out, especially for security reasons. But the new software versions, um, I'm sorry, the older software versions they were using were N-2 and N-1. They quickly learned that that was not enough using those old patches. So the issue stemmed from a misunderstanding about how updates were applied. While the N-1 and the N-2 update policy protected the agent software, it didn't cover the signature files, which were updated globally regardless of version settings. Yeah, and this oversight led to a wave of boot loops and blue screen of deaths across millions of systems. As one admin noted, they were hit because the update was a content. It was basically a signature file that bypassed their auto update restrictions. So this situation underscores how critical it is to fully understand your update mechanisms. So I really, you know, I was really looking into this and and talking to this about this with my customers also. And this So N minus one and N minus two, basically it's like, okay, we're going to run at, you know, not the latest version, but we're going to run at, you know, one less to the latest or two levels back. And what different companies were saying is sometimes they would say, well, we're going to run at N minus one or for our critical um, devices, we'll run at N minus two. And you know, one of the things is like what you said, you want to have these software updates because you want to be secure. But at the same time, on these N minus one, so one of the things that happened in this situation is that some companies that had a policy and they were actually, you know, running this one behind where they shouldn't have been affected, CrowdStrike actually overrode that. And so it didn't, you know, they basically, they still got the blue screen of death. So that was one of the things that happened. But just, you know, going back and reading this article, and this was the register that had this, and then also um, Microsoft was also talking about this also, that um, CrowdStrike recommended in their like customer support documentation to actually run one level behind. So that, I mean, so that that was news to me. But then the fact that there's two different, you know, you, it can be the software update and the signature update. So that's the other thing. Some people had it set. They didn't have it for the signature update. But then also it didn't matter anyway in this case. So, but it did, this whole thing got me thinking and to discuss this with my customers. And, and we had talked about this on the 
previous podcast too, about just, you know, doing like a 24 hour delay. So not that you would actually just stay on, you know, this one level behind always, but, you know, you could just do a delay possibly like 24 hours and just different, you know, situations like in order to prevent this from happening again. Right. And I agree with what you're saying, like kind of having that 24 hour delay or even if they're able to test it on, you know, designated devices, you know, not just send out this mass update that they are unsure if it's going to crash systems or not keep things up and running. But I mean, in this situation, trust was a major casualty in this entire incident. Many administrators felt betrayed because CrowdStrike overrode their settings for this release, which, you know, what they thought was a well-planned update strategy ended up backfiring. So Microsoft's analysts have highlighted some key lessons from this, which are worth paying attention to. First and foremost, staging updates is critical. As Microsoft analysts pointed out, you should always use deployment rings to apply updates to a small set of devices before rolling them out widely. But remember, as Michael Cherry from Directions on Microsoft said, don't set auto update and forget. You need to be vigilant and ready to pause updates if things start to go wrong. And I've, I mean, I have been, I've done this, you know, I've done this where I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to do auto updates. I'm safe, you know, but this whole situation's got me really thinking about the updates and having a strategy and everything. Yeah, for sure. And honestly, sometimes it's even out of our hands, you know, having to be forced to update you know, working for a big corporation and, you know, having a mobile device, you know, manager or form of management on like your personal devices. Like for instance, the other day, my job told me, they were like, Hey, your phone is not secure right now because you did not do the latest Apple update. And I was like, I was like, I'm not compliant right now because my phone is not updated. Okay. (laughs) So before, you know, usually I wait days to do the Apple updates, but now I'm like, wow, I really have to do them when they come out because if not, I'll get flagged on my end. So, but even then, you know, you don't know what you're signing up for. If you do the update now, are you making yourself less secure or are you potentially putting yourself at risk for, you know, causing an issue to the operating system? Yeah. So, yeah, but. Second that, I mean, system hygiene is key. So Jim Gaynor from Directions on Microsoft emphasized the importance of minimizing the risk of endpoint failure and optimizing recovery processes. This includes having easy access to BitLocker keys, ensuring current and tested imaging and deployment processes, and having clear documentation. For distributed companies, having regional points of contact is crucial. Yeah, so the BitLocker recovery keys in particular should be treated as a vital part of your disaster recovery plan. As Wes Miller noted, without these keys, a mass repair effort could become a painful one-by-one process. Additionally, think carefully about where you're using Windows, especially in embedded systems like checkout kiosks or digital billboards, where manual fixes can be a major headache. And let's not forget that you're at the mercy of your vendors. Even if you have strong policies in place, your vendors might not. Microsoft's legal obligations mean they can't change their policy of allowing security vendors deep access to the Windows kernel. So staying vigilant is your best defense. Okay, so now we're going to shift to another major breach that um, I was just reading about this week. It was on Bleeping Computer, but there's this massive data breach that just hit the news, nearly 2.7 billion records of personal information were leaked on a hacking forum. This data includes names, social security numbers, physical addresses, and possible aliases, all exposed in plain text. Yikes, that sounds terrifying. Yeah. So the data allegedly comes from National Public Data, a company known for collecting and selling access to personal information for background checks and other purposes. This breach is massive. And while it doesn't contain the current addresses for everyone, it's still incredibly dangerous. The leak includes information for millions of people in the U.S. and it's crucial to 
to understand the potential risk. Bleeping Computer reported that it that this data breach could affect nearly every person in the U.S. And there are already multiple class action lawsuits against national public data for failing to protect this sensitive information. If you live in the U.S., this breach likely includes some of your personal data. It's important to monitor your credit report for any fraudulent activity and be vigilant against phishing attempts. And let's be clear, this isn't just about old, outdated information. The data includes social security numbers, which could be used for identity theft. Even if some addresses are outdated, the risk is real. This breach reinforces the importance of protecting personal data at every level and being prepared for the fallout when things go wrong. I mean, Deborah, have you had any issues in the past with you know, any form of like theft, whether it's personal information or any kind of fraud. I've only ever had maybe like, I think a debit card hit once, but I've never, thankfully, you know, knock on wood, experienced right. anything. I uh, did like one time, actually one time I went, it was to a Sonic and I went through, like normally you would just, you know, pay. I mean, that's sort of the thing, you know, you sit in your car and all that. But I went through the drive through and I used my credit card and thank goodness I actually used my credit card. But within 24 hours, so somebody there had to have some sort of swipe device. Then 24 hours, then like all these weird things started showing up on my credit card and they contacted me like that next day. And the company, you know, contacted me and said, look, you know, is this, did you do this? And I was like, no. And so in that sense, I have my, my husband, he actually had his driver's license. We don't know how, but his driver's license was stolen. I mean, he had his driver's license, but they made a copy of it. And so um, like a private detective called him one day and said, oh, are you trying to buy this Mercedes in Florida? And he's like, no. And what we found out, he sent um, the detective sent my husband the picture of the driver's license and it, it had like most of the information but there was just a few things wrong a few things that weren't correct and so somebody at some point got it and got a really high quality scan of his license and so he just like immediately went and signed up for one of those where they you know they track it all the time I'm trying to remember the name of the company but you know, you're protected up to a million dollars and all of this. And uh, so, you know, he's like, and, and, and this is really weird. So another time I got called, he was out on a bike ride and they called me, the police called me from Georgia and they were, they basically, they started telling me that this person had died. He was on a bike ride. Now, the thing was, they were in Georgia. They were like, this person just died and, um, you know, we're, we're calling you to let you know. And that, that was when I knew it wasn't him because, you know, I'm like, he's not in Georgia. So, and so what happened was this person that died had like several different licenses under different names, different aliases. And so they did not know which one was correct. And so we were like, Oh, there it is. You know, His license again. <laughs> you, you bringing that up actually reminded me. I had also a person call me, you know, trying to sound frantic on the phone saying, Hey, your brother just got, you know, run over by a car. And I'm just like, like, yeah, your, your brother got, you know, ran over by a car. Like we need you here. And mind you, I would imagine they were in Florida because they, probably knew that I had a Florida um, area code at that point. And he was like, yeah, you have to come, blah, 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 which I don't really know where the scam would have took me in the end, like what they try to get out of people. But I told him, I was like, I don't know who you think you're talking to, but I don't have any siblings. And then he hung up. Okay. And so I'm like, yeah. so it's, I don't know what they want. I don't know what people want to do. I mean, people apparently want to get Mercedes Benz with, someone else's driver's license right but, right like, yeah exactly it was just like yeah and in this case 
this was actual law enforcement, but I knew it was like, at first for a minute, I was a little nervous because I knew he was out on a bike ride, but I'm like, wait, I'm like, where are you at? And then, then, then they're like, oh, we're in Folsom County, Georgia. And I was like, yeah, no, <laughs> this is not, this is not my husband, you know? And, and then they went You're on like, and explained. Can, can bike, but not that far. Yeah, yeah. Then then they went on and explained, oh, that this person had several licenses, so and aliases. So they, you know, there's some sort of criminal element to it. So but yeah, it's it's scary. It is scary. Okay. So so what's the big takeaway from today's episode? Whether it's a faulty update from a trusted vendor or a massive data breach. The need for vigilance and preparedness cannot be overstated. Understand your update mechanisms, stage updates carefully, and always be ready to act when disaster strikes. And in the face of data breaches, take immediate steps to protect your identity and stay alert for any signs of fraud. Absolutely. And to all the admins, CISOs, and IT professionals listening, Make sure you're fully informed about your systems and the risks you're facing. Whether it's handling updates or safeguarding personal data, staying proactive is your best defense. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of CISO Guide to Cyber Resilience. Be sure to subscribe and share if you found our discussion valuable. Until next time, stay resilient, stay informed, and keep your systems secure. Well, thank you, Deborah. Thank you for this fantastic episode and we will be back again at it next week with some new updated information. Great. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to pick up a copy of my book, a CISO guide to cyber resilience available on Amazon. And remember to stay cyber resilient.